Thank you very much for being here and uh, participating in my presentation. I know that there are many other interesting presentation at the same time, so I really appreciate for you to participate in this presentation. But as a disclaimer, this is my first presentation outside of my workplace, so I'm sorry if I'm a bit nervous or if I will make any mistakes along the way. <laughs> Please excuse me. So let's start. So my name is Vinod. Um, I think that's that's only we need to know at this moment for this presentation. Uh, but I'm going to talk more about identity and access management. Uh, so before jumping into more details about identity and access management, I want to make sure that uh, we all are on the same page with the three terminologies, which is very important. Otherwise, you may not get this entire presentation. The first one is identity. What is identity? Identity is a an attribute or set of attributes that uniquely describe a subject within a given context. So the uniqueness is very important. So if the attribute or set of attributes cannot uniquely describe, you shouldn't be using that as an identity. Um, as an example, um, you know, your passport is an identity document and you may have a passport number and name that uniquely describe you uh, for that particular identity document. The next one is authentication. It's a little confusing even in the security domain what is authentication and what is authorization. So authentication is the process of verifying the identity. So that's sim as simple as it is. It may be the identity of a user, it can be identity of a process, or it can be identity of a device. So authentication is as simple as it's a process of verifying identity. As an example, if you will take your uh, passport to an immigration officer, he will make sure that you are, that passport is belongs to you. So he will authenticate to you. Also, one of the common form of authentication we use in the web is a username and password, even though it's not a great authentication way. The next terminology is authorization. <laughs> authorization typically happen after authentication. So you are expecting the authentication to be happen before authorization. So authorization is a typically granting an access based on some attributes. That's simple as it is. So authorization is little different from authentication. If you want to do an authorization, you should do authentication first. So why we need IAM? So I am will help us to ensure that the right people have access to the right things at the right time. It is very important that right people will have access to the right things at the right time. Also, it will help us to keep the wrong people out. So that is also important for an I am. In fact, I am is there to ensure CAM, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. You need a proper, secure IAM in order to ensure CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. It's essential to have a secure IAM in order to implement that. This is not a secure identity and access management. In fact, <laughs> this is an insecure way to do it, and it's a useless. And unfortunately, we have similar type of identity and access management with all our application and many application. It's also studies reveal that 81 percentage of breaches involve stolen or weak credentials, and 91 percentage of attacks are target credentials. And unfortunately, 73 percentage of passwords are duplicate. This is a sad reality. These studies are a bit old. Recently, there is a slight decrease in this number, but the thing is that bad people are interested in insecure IAM. They, they are looking to exploit insecure IAM and get at your access. How to implement a secure IAM? The easy way to do secure IAM, just go and read the NIST National Institute of Standards and Technology. NIST published a special publication called Digital Identity Guideline, 863 and 3. It has a total of 400 pages. If you want, if you are interested to read it, I haven't read completely. So, yeah. And interestingly, even OWASP, we have an application security verification standard, which also is a simplified version of a NIST identity guideline. We have nearly 100 plus 
security requirements related to secure iam inside application security verification standard so let's look into a traditional ways of implementing iam as you can see there is a user an application and an identity store so the identity and access management is completely implemented in the application so each and every application will be handling their own identity and access management and user will be authenticate against that particular application he may be using username and password uh, or whatever other shared secret to authenticate and his authentication credential may be stored in a stand alone or shared database it can be an ldap storage as well the problem with this way of doing iam is that all those security requirements i mentioned with the nist and the application security verification all those are applicable to this application so you know the the developers will have to spend a significant amount of to amount of time to secure implement a secure iam with their application so let's try a modern way of implementing applic uh, secure iam so as you can see in the this lego uh, they have created a fortress and secure all those six or seven buildings inside that so those six seven building they don't need to worry about their own iam so what their security is depending on the the main fortress which is protecting their uh, their buildings right so yeah so we can do the similar logic for our software security or for our applications so we can do the same thing sorry <laughs> we can do the same thing with uh, our applications we can have a central identity and access management system which will fortify all our application all our applications will trust our central identity and access management system and users will be authenticate against central identity and access management system this is what google does this is what uh microsoft does this is what apple does almost all technology company they don't handle identity and access management individually with their own application they have a federated identity and access management the big benefit is that none of these individual application don't have to handle the authentication so they are not tightly coupled with the authentication mechanism so even you know tomorrow there is a new way of authenticating user they can easily get that benefit from the central identity and access management system because they don't have to implement any multi factor authentication biometric authentication whatever authentication so they don't need to worry they can directly consume from the identity access as also as they are not handling the user credential their attack surface is reduced as i mentioned attackers are interested in insecure application which is handling i am insecurely so if they are not handling any credential attackers are won't be interested in to hack those application <laughs> so user authentication can be reused across the application so this can enable a single sign on experience if you go to your gmail or g drive you will log into accounts.google.com once and you will have that uh, single sign on experience across all other google application that is that will enable a better user experience for the user also the federated identity and access management will help with the visibility for both cyber security team also so end user about what are the login sessions they have if if they want they can even revoke a session which is you know unwanted section and as authentication happening across multiple applications through identity access management system there will be more contextual information about the authentication in the central line uh, what i mean is uh, if your uh, gmail is accessed from china now and someone else is accessing g drive from uh, russia or america accounts.google.com can know you know you have multiple authentication sequence which don't looks right and it may be bitored your account may be compromised so that is very important to share that uh, login information from different application open id connect so open id connect is a way to implement a federated identity and access management as per open id foundation's definition open id connect is a simple identity layer on auth to protocol 
It allows clients to verify the identity of end user based on authentication performed by the authorization server. So, as you can see in the underpinning, there is auth and JWT, all other auth protocol suite and JWT suite inside OpenID Connect. In fact, OpenID Connect is so many other protocol stack in auth protocol. OpenID Foundation. So OpenID Foundation is the foundation behind OpenID Connect. The OpenID Foundation promotes, protects, nurtures the OpenID community and his, its technology. So OpenID Connect has different working group. One of the interesting working group is FAPI. It's, it's the, it's called financial grade API, which is used for a UK's open banking to implement the payment service directive to, which is an extended version of OpenID Connect so that banks can securely federate their customers that are between financial services and they make the payments and required things, right? So, and there are, there are other interesting working group like iGov, which is for a government-based identity and a risk and for hurt for a medical industry. So there are like a more focused working group to provide more secure identity and access management for different industry. JSON Web Token. This is a, one of the very important thing in OpenID Connect. The, this is the mess. This, this is how OpenID Connect exchange the identity information between the clients and resource server. So JSON Web Token is basically a URL based, URL based stick or encoded data. Uh, if you will decode it, it has mainly three parts. One is header. The first part is header. The second part is the claim. That is the actual data. The third part is the signature, which is uh, signed by the, your identity provider. So identity provider will have a private key. So they will sign the JWT token using their private key. And they have an endpoint where they expose the corresponding public key. So the clients or relying parties can go and take that public key and verify this token is actually signed by the identity provider. So if you will decode the token, you can see the the first part, uh, the, what type of algorithm is used for this JWT token and uh, what type of token it is. It is a JWT token and what type of key is used to sign it. So that's a key reference that client can go and check for the key reference and get corresponding public key, which they can use to verify the signature. And in the claims, there are so many uh, metadata around the each and every attribute has its own importance. Uh, some of them have security sensitivity. So that's, it's a must have in the OpenID Connect. So there is a difference between OS2 and OpenID Connect. OS2 is more like a framework which will help you to create other protocol stack. OpenID Connect is a tailored version of OS2, which makes it mandatory to do the certain things to ensure there is a certain level of security. So even it can have the basic profile information about the user. <laughs> this is a typical OpenID Connect authorization code flow. So as you can see, there is a resource owner, uh, which is also known as a user, and there is a client. Client, you can consider maybe say Gmail or G Drive, whatever it is. So the N application, which which want to authenticate the user and the, in, get the information about the user. The identity provider it can be accounts.google.com. So that is an identity provider by Google and resource server can be further API, like maybe contacts API or some API, which can provide more information about the user. So when user try to access the Gmail, Gmail will say, oh, I don't know about you. I will redirect you to accounts.google.com. So it will redirect the user to accounts.google.com and the user will enter his credential there and uh, authenticate himself against identity provider. So he's not sharing his password with the Gmail. He's only sharing his password or any credential with accounts.google.com. Then he will get redirected back with an authorization code. The Gmail or Google Drive will use that authorization code and it will have its own client secret. So this flow is used for the clients who can securely keep the secret. So it will use its secret to identify which client it is and it will take that uh, authorization code and send a back channel request to the accounts.google.com. Then accounts.google.com will provide ID token and access token and optionally a refresh token if it is needed. And 
Gmail can use the tokens to get more uh, data from other internal APIs from Google. So this is a slightly different version of the authorization code flow with Pixie because there are cases where um, you can't keep a client secret in your clients. Uh, as an example, there will be mobile application, JavaScript single page application like Angular, React, and there are several applications where you can't keep the client secret. In that case, there won't be any secret in the client. What client will do is client will generate a unique random code for each authentication sequence. When a user comes, it will generate a unique sequence and it will also convert that, that random code to hash and it will send that hash to the identity provider, which is also known as a code challenge. So when the user authenticate with identity provider, it will again, it will get an authorization code. When it will receive the code, it will take the actual random code, which is also known as code verifier, and it will use that code and send to the identity provider. Identity provider already know the hash of the initial code, so identity provider will convert this, this code verifier and compare the hash, then only it will give the tokens back to the client. So this is a discovery endpoint for a Google. So there is a standard URL for uh, most of the OpenID kind of discovery endpoint. As you can see, a client, when a client will access this URL, it will get all the information about where is the authorization server, where is the token endpoint, and where it can fetch the public key about the uh, identity provider. So if you'll go to the public key URL, you can find all the public key by Google, which Google used to sign the JWT token. So you can take this uh, public key and verify if the token is actually issued by the accounts.google.com. SAML. So SAML is a traditional way of doing federation. It's also known as security assertion markup language. Uh, OpenID is considered as a successor of SAML. So SAML always focusing on an organization centric. So that means uh, if your organization want to exchange data from one application to another application. Whereas OpenID Connect is more about a user centric. If user want to exchange his data from identity provider to the client. So, and SAML use XML message format to exchange the data. Whereas OpenID Connect use JSON and Rust and both communicate through HTTPS. SAML security is based on XML security. All the XML insecurity is also applicable to SAML. All the XML parser issues or all other issues related to XML. Whereas uh, OpenID is kind of based on JSON object signing and encryption. And client registration is static in SAML, whereas in OpenID kind of client registration can be dynamic also. And identity discovery and deployed discovery is also static in SAML. In OpenID Connect is uh, dynamic. As I showed you the before, that URL, that's a standard URL. Any clients can go there and get all the identity provider information. SAML is using front end channel for attribute exchange, whereas OpenID Connect use both front end and back end channel to communicate with the identity provider. And SAML is mainly used for a web application, whereas OpenID can, can be used for web application, mobile application, JavaScript, single page, whatever you want to integrate. The benefits of OpenID Connect. So OpenID Connect will enable end-to-end, -end, up to the API level, federated intent access management system. So you don't have to create your own auth to authorization server in order to communicate with your API. You can hand over your uh, access token to your API, that token can be verified with an OpenID provider server. It also enables with a lightweight token and encourage developers to use it frequently along with their HTTP requests as a bearer token. As it's lightweight, it's also easier to implement a short-lived token. So OpenID Connect will also help to get the consent from user, which is very important for GDPR. So if uh, if you are logging with the Google 
pl- uh, sign with the google google will normally ask do you want to share your uh, inbox access or contact access and you can tailor down what kind of access if you want to give to a third party client you have a possibility to do that it's a it's in the protocol but it's not a default option you want if you want you can enable it especially if you want to share the authentication information with the third party clients and open id foundation has so many certified libraries to integrate with open id provider server and there are so many certified open id prov- provider identity server which you can use so open id kind of certification it's very important to have you have a strong strong integration it doesn't matter if you have a secure identity provider and secure application if your integration is weak you are uh, you, you will lose all the security benefits from open id connect so there are certified open id providers and certified relying parties available from open id connect there most of them are free and there are some services but if you go to openid.net certification you can find a whole list of certified providers you can just reuse all those relying party for your application it yeah also it will help with the less development efforts so yeah you don't have to spend too much development effort to make this integration these are few of the open id kind of certified there are so many others i'm sorry i can't list all of them here so this uh, key clock is one of the my favorite open id provider which is a free and open source software you know you can simply run using a docker command and run a open id connect certified identity provider and you know you don't have to worry about all those security requirements from nist and the application security this all of them are implemented in key clock or even identity server is another one Appoth is a client integration SDK, so we, it's a, it's mainly used for mobile applications. So if you want to integrate your mobile application with an Open ID Connect, you can use Appoth. Appoth is originally from Google. Google donated to Open ID Foundation. So yeah, so custom implementation and integration. You know, we all have colleagues who always like to try things and they want to do all the things by themselves. So, yeah, please avoid if possible. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are so many certified integrators, but if, if you still have to do it, if you still want to do it, OpenID Foundation also provide test automation suite which you can run against your implementation and make sure that your implementation follow the specification if your implementation don't follow the specification there is a chance of a security issue associated with sorry fido too so now we federate everything to the one place and we we make sure that all the authentication is happening through that place and we don't want that other guys to do the authentication in front of your open id server that's where fido2 co- comes fido stands for fast identity online so fido include both the ctap and webauthn i think should be covered about webauthn which is one part of fido2 standard protocol fido2 enable a stronger authentication using public key cryptography in the traditional authentication we keep the shared secret in our apl- application or even in our identity provider so ac- attackers are always interested to hack that uh, shared secret in your database but in fido2 we have public key cryptography we have s- public key just related to the particular website or host name is in your database even an attacker get access to that public key he can't use anything with that so this is a high level picture how different protocols comes into play so you have device called authenticator and you also have fido2 server uh, fido2 server will communicate to your browser through web open api then your laptop will communicate through your authenticator using ceta protocol <laughs> so fido2 provide phishing free authentication so no one can 
fish phyto to authentication so phyto in phyto to they verify the origin and they also verify the signature so you can't even host a phishing domain and fake the signature or uh, sign it and phyto to also prevent man in the middle by verifying the challenge and signature and phyto to prevent reply attack by verifying the counter in both authenticator and server side so there are different forms of authenticator so there are authenticator called platform authenticator and there are authenticators called roaming authenticator the platform authenticator if you have android 7 plus your phone is a platform authenticator if you have windows hello with your windows 10 you can use it as a platform authenticator you don't have to buy a key that is a roaming authenticator if you want to use across multiple devices or multiple laptop you can also use a roaming authenticator so this website uh, explain very well how uh, i think i have enough time so yeah i will show so this if you will go to if you have a mobile phone with android 7 you can give a try and or if you have a windows 10 hello uh, you can give a try with your laptop so This is a test registration don't worry about the data you are entering there they, they won't persist your data so i will put a test 1 2 3 so i have a fido to authenticator external authenticator roaming so i have fingerprint reader there so it will show you how it is happening in the animation not just the web authen part also with the uh c tap authenticator so now i just need to touch my key it should now release a public key so it will sign it and register with the website it will show all the process now i have an id and public key registered with the fido server if i will click login nest i will use this id as login so it will show me pop up just need to touch again then i guess yeah yeah anyway login is a, so if you want to try with more debugging you can enable the debugger and get more technical detail how this protocol works but it is very important to know about fido2 it is going to have a serious impact on how we authenticate and fido2 works very well with open id connect so you can implement a fido server in your identity provider so you don't have to implement fido2 inside your each and every application that is a wrong strategy to do fido2 implementation your application don't even need to worry how your identity provider is doing it so if your identity provider got the fido2 implementation they can easily consume that strong authentication So as you can see the fido server is inside your identity provider and the the applications as i mentioned in the previous flows always re- redirect the user to your identity provider like accounts.google.com so google also got a fido2 authenticator support you can use that to yeah implement a secure authentication so Yeah, please don't roll your own identity and access management using a custom OAuth to or JWT. Uh, please use OpenID Connect instead. Yeah. So that's pretty much it. Any questions? So if you want to ask me more questions later, you know you can send me email or you can contact me on Twitter. I'm happy to answer the question. But I think we have enough time for questions now. Yeah. Go. Hi, um, great presentation. Um, I'm I'm sorry if you've covered what I'm about to ask because I missed the first part of mm-hmm. um, the presentation. Um, but you emphasized on um, not rolling out your own custom impl- implementation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've seen a setup before, and uh, which I've criticized, and I would like to get your thoughts on it. Um, so um, there was a decision to use Keycloak mm-hmm. um, for authentication within um, a project on the site. um but as time went on um it became a thing of um building business rules on top of keycloak 
You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And Key Cloak ended up being um just a token issuer, yeah. right? Um and for verification, pretty much just that. Yeah. And in my head, I'm like, why not just create your own JWT and put the scope and what whatnot policies that whatever information you need mm-hmm. for authorization thereafter yeah. and stick it into JWT and figure out um you know your renewal strategy and things like that. And I've, I've seen articles on, on Medium with people doing great things like that, which seemed like a no-brainer to me to, to a, a normal site. But of course, there are still things you might miss as a um, as, as someone building your own custom solution. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on doing something like that for custom, um, whether you think it's a good idea or, um, or you think the key cloak slash whatever tool, open ID tool that is out there. Um, what your thoughts are on that? So I don't know exactly what is your custom requirements, but normally with identity and authentication, it's a common requirement for everybody. You need to have a proper identity information and you need to authenticate a user, right? So maybe some advanced fine-grained or coarse-grained authorization issues you may have. Still, if you are using key clock properly, right? So key clock has a different ways to implement a fine-grained access control. It also has support for um, uh, UAM, uh, which is another protocol for a coarse-grained uh, access control. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, it doesn't matter if you're using Keyclock or anything like that. Keyclock itself is an open source software, right? So if you want to customize something, you can do that. There is no way you can even extend the Keyclock if you want to do it. But, you know, the point is that don't do that in individual applications, right? So you federate everything. And you have a one central system which will do it. It may be Keyclock or it may be some other software. It's better in that pattern uh, rather than going and doing an identity and access management with each and every individual application, which will be a pain point because you have to focus on all those security requirements and you will definitely miss. And your developers are not there to do a secure IAM. They are there, there to deliver business functionality. That's they are more bothered about, right? So it's better to do in this pattern in a federated, but as I mentioned, if there is a custom requirements, you can still implement in your central identity provider, right? So, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, then. Thank you.